I'm joined now by a, a really intriguing rookie on the PGA Tour. He's a Corn Ferry Tour graduate, earned his PGA Tour card for the first time at the age of 27, coming off a hell of a week at the Valspar Championship, a career best finish of third, which got our attention. And Chandler Phillips is in the field this week at the Texas Children's Houston Open, just about an hour south of where he grew up in Huntsville, Texas. Chandler, it's good to have you on the podcast. I appreciate some of your time. What's happening? How's the week going there in your home state? Yeah, it's great. Happy to be home. It feels like a home event, but uh, uh, we'll see how many uh, how many of family and friends show up and <laughs> make it feel like home. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a lot. Uh, have they been out for the practice rounds and stuff this week so far? No, no. I mean, my mom and dad, they came out and did, I don't know what they had them do, but uh, Monday... They came out and was here for about an hour, and then they had to go back. My dad had some work he had to get done, and my mom, who knows, she, she retired about a year and a half ago, and now she's just kind of rolling around everywhere, just kind of doing <laughs> her own thing. Pretty cool, though, right? Because I'm sure they made a lot of sacrifices for you along the way, right? I mean, nobody gets to the top level of their profession in any sport without a lot of people supporting them uh, along the way. So it must be pretty special for you to be able to showcase your talents on the PGA Tour and, and have your mom and dad kind of soak it in here this week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I play to make them proud uh, on and off the golf course, just be who I can be and, you know, be the son that they raised to, to be. And I think I'm living up to it, but... <laughs> I mean, they may have a different opinion on it, but yeah. Um, so how's the rookie season been going for you? Just sort of broad brush. What's the transition from the Corn Ferry Tour like in terms of the competition and the travel and you know everything you're dealing with? It can be a whirlwind when you're a rookie on the PGA Tour. Are you getting comfortable, getting adjusted? Yeah. No, I, I, I think it's, for, for me, I think it's very similar Honestly, I don't see any difference in it. Um, I mean, the the competition's, I think, just as good. Uh, I think anybody on the Corn Ferry could come and play a PGA Tour event and win any given week. That just shows where the game is at nowadays. I mean, there's so much competition, um, and the the only I, I will say the only thing that is different is that I'm not playing for a PGA Tour card. Uh, and it, it's it's kind of relaxing, you know. I can I I feel actually a little bit more relaxed out here because I'm here, you know. I'm I don't I don't have to play like all year to move to the next level. I've I've kind of reached the top level in the the golf industry, and it's uh, feels really nice. What a feeling it must be for sure, yeah. and to win so early. On the KFT last year, I mean, you won the first event of the season. That had to take a little bit of heat off for the rest of the campaign, didn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, winning the first event last year was all weight and gravity just pulling me down, you know, just uh, just knowing that you got to play really, really good golf all year to, you know, finish inside the top 30. And, I mean, even when you finish inside the top 30, you you still want to finish finish high in in that thirty range just so you can you know guarantee yourself a few more starts or anything like that. But winning the first event, it just kind of like okay, now we can just relax and you know really just play normal golf and just like we're at home and just uh, really soak it in and enjoy it. And the way you went about it without realizing where you stood was, I, I find hard to believe. A lot of guys say they don't look at leaderboards, but it's hard to avoid them out there. Mm -hmm. You knew you were playing well. You knew you were kind of in the hunt. You didn't realize you were winning the tournament by two shots until you were walking up 18 green on the final day, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that is one thing that is different on the PJ Tour than the Corn Ferry. Uh, PJ Tour, definitely, I have noticed that there is a lot of scoreboards out here, and they are staring at you right in your face. Uh, but Corn Ferry, you know, being in the Bahamas, you know, the first four, I think it's now six, uh, or, you know, kind of international, you know, two in the Bahamas and then four in the Latin America. Um, they don't have as many scoreboards uh, to, you know, display around the course. 
just because it's kind of hard to get down there, you know. And um, there was one between, I think, 15 or 16 to 17 T. But I knew if I just kept my head down and just kept on walking, I could avoid it. So I just, I, I kind of walked fast and just, just didn't even look because I knew as soon as I got to 17 T, I couldn't see it. So I was just like, I'm just going to keep on walking. I'm going to do my thing. And, you know, wherever I end up, I end up. If it's, if it's on top, it's on top. If not, I still had one hell of a week. So uh, that's kind of just where I was in my mindset. I mentioned in the introduction, you finished third last week at the Valspar Championship. Nice work because that Copperhead course is no joke. What was <laughs> yeah. it like to be in the hunt to try and win on the PGA Tour for the first time? Yeah, no, it, it was great. It was kind of, uh, honestly, uh, caught me by surprise how, I guess, comfortable I was. You know, I, I, I didn't get too nervous. Uh, I saw plenty of scoreboards. I, I saw where I was at, you know, especially on 14, the last day I, I hit it on and two in the part five and two putter for birdie. And I think that tied me for the lead. And I, I mean, it's just staring at me right there. I got to walk right past it, but surprisingly it honestly didn't phase me one bit because I knew we still had four holes left and anything could happen on my end or the other guy's ends. And, I was just like, we got four holes left. We gotta, we gotta finish our round. You know, it's uh, so yeah. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty surprising. I feel like the Sunday pairing probably broke nicely for you, right? You played with Cam Champ, yeah. a good buddy of yours. That you guys were college teammates at uh, Texas A and M. That must have been nice and comfortable. Maybe take uh, alleviate a little bit of the pressure, take a little bit of the air out of the room going into Sunday. Yeah. No, it was. I mean, when I got the tea time on Saturday evening after the rounds were finished. And I saw that Cam was, me and Cam were playing together in a twosome. I was like, this couldn't have worked out. <laughs> like if, if I'm going to play good, this is going to be the round that I'll play really good, you know? And uh, I got off to a hot start. You know, we were both playing really well for, you know, seven holes or so um, and kind of neck and neck with each other and just kind of inching up the leaderboard and, having a good time, you know, waiting for each other off the green. If we made a birdie or, you know, one other guy made a birdie, would just, you know, fist bump or just kind of had a little trash talking in there, even though it's a <laughs> Sunday and we're in contention. But that's, uh, yeah, he's one of my best friends. So roommates for three years, you, you get pretty close to somebody. All right. What does trash talking on the golf course during a PGA Tour Sunday look and sound like? Come on now. Uh, I don't, I, I forget what he said. He's, he said something. Oh, it was, uh, it was number five. You know, I hit it to eight, nine feet and he hit his to like five feet or something like that. He was like, just let me know if you want a wedge lesson. I'm like, quit talking. Just quit talking. Well, I'm going to make mine. You're going to make yours and we're going, I'll, I'll show you some wedges. <laughs> <laughs> you guys both live in the College Station area where you played uh, collegiately. Do you guys see each other in your off weeks? Get a little friendly money game going? Anything like that? Yeah. So he, he actually lives in kind of like the Magnolia area. If we're not in the event for the week or we, we both take off at the same time, we definitely like link up and, you know, we'll meet at a course and play and practice together all day and it's good. You want you want to practice with people that are your same caliber of play, and you know it, th the bad thing is is you know we help each other out with you know practice, and you know I I feel like I can help him a little bit with his chipping, and um, but he can't really help me with any of my stuff because he can't teach how to hit the ball far. You can't teach that. And he has the God-given talent of just absolutely like murdering the ball. So I'm like, hey, how you, how you, uh, how you hit it so far? You want to give me some pointers? I give you some pointers on your chipping, you know? So no, nah, it, it's all fun and games with us all the time. Yeah, I think that's one of the cool things about the brotherhood on the PGA Tour, Chandler, that you point out, despite 
the competition being so cutthroat, especially on Sundays, is that guys are willing to share their expertise and share their knowledge and the things that they've learned through the years and kind of pay it forward. I know you had a really positive experience with Ricky Fowler. This was early COVID pandemic yeah. and you picked up a putting tip from Ricky, right? He was more than willing to help you out. Yeah, no, he he was great. I mean, I was a very up and down um, kind of putter. Like when I was on, I felt like I made everything. But when I was off, I feel like I couldn't hit the hole from, you know, five feet. So um, when I did message Ricky and we kind of started talking and he offered to help me out. Um, ever since then, I've become a lot more consistent putter. Um, and it's it's done nothing but help me. And and really and truly, I don't wear him out at all. I, I talked to him. I can't tell you the last time I have talked to him about putting. You know, it was, it was just kind of, it, it was never in person. It was just kind of over the phone, just send videos. He would send me a video and we just kind of like text about it. Um, but I mean, everything that he told me for me to work on, once I kind of cleaned all that up and started working on it pretty hard, it, my, my putting's gotten so much more consistent. Um, so yeah, it, it's been great. Lake Estates Golf Course in the Huntsville area where Chandler Phillips first started to play the game. They called the place the Pea Patch. Nothing fancy, just a dusty little nine holer. And it was not uncommon for you and your dad, Keith, to play eight, nine hole loops, maybe 72 holes in a day. That sounds like so much fun for a young kid to learn the game with his dad on a course like that. What were those experiences like for you? <laughs> they were, they were awesome. There was probably, I would say 20 to 30, you know, give or take, um, guys that we would just, you know, get in threesome foursomes and first group would go, second group would go, you know, we just, and we'd lap around all day. And it was honestly kind of a drunk fest for all those guys out there. I mean, it was, I think it really showed me just kind of how to just have fun. Everybody's out there just having a good time playing golf, having nothing to do and, and like nothing else planned other than playing from daylight till dark. That's what we did most Saturdays and Sundays growing up. I know family is so important from you. I've seen some interviews and I've read some articles, especially the relationship, a really special one you have with your little brother, Dawson, who's autistic. He's three years younger than you. You've said he is my best friend in the world. No yeah. other way to describe it. He's my best friend. You've said, if I need to care for him full time and step away from this, the game someday, I'm going to do that. That's going to be the plan. It's almost like you're playing for a higher purpose. How much inspiration has Dawson provided you in your lifetime? All of it. I mean, that, I mean, he's, that's what I'm playing for because I mean, it's not a, if I will step away from the game, it, I, I will, you know, if I hope, I hope like hell that my parents, you know, live a long, long time, but I mean, you never know what's going to happen. And, uh, once they, you know, pass or, you know, anything happens and they need my help, I'm done. Uh, I, I'm not putting him in a a care home or anything like that. That's my brother. Like, uh, so I'm going to take care of him as much as I can, you know, and hopefully I can make a, a good career out of this game. We call golf and make enough money where I can, uh, you know, have a, have a job after that. I don't have to do too much and spend a lot of time with him. And, you know, once that day comes, it comes, but I've, I've faced that fact and I'm not having anybody else take care of him other than me. That's some real perspective there that is not often found in someone who's just getting their career going at, at the highest level as you are. Yeah. And you guys are so immersed in every component of the game and you're so obsessed with it. And there's expanding entourages, let's say that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that guys have um, all kinds of different coaches and, Every stone is uh, is turned over in an effort right. to get better. You keep your circle pretty tight, though, don't you, Chandler? Yeah, yeah. No, I, <laughs> I, I mean, it sounds bad, and I don't want it to sound like I just think I can do this by myself. I mean, I have, I have my people that uh, that help me, and uh, 
but it's it's mainly family, uh, my agents, and uh, my caddy. And I don't have any coaches for any part of the game, mental swing, anything like that. But I did work with a guy. His name's Dean Choate. Uh, he was at my home course in Huntsville. Um, we worked for I don't know how long. And um, I mean, when I say I don't know how long, it's like six to nine years probably. And we worked so much together and we would play golf with each other so much that uh, I've always had one tendency and it's just to get underneath. He helped me a lot with that to, you know, get, get the club on plane and everything like that. And like I said, it's just the same tendency anytime when I don't hit it or I'm not hitting it well. Um, so I just kind of go back to what we worked on 10 years ago and it, it, it kind of, it cleans it up pretty fast, but he was an amazing coach when we worked together and, but and I think we, we still would be working together, but he, he just got out of the golf industry. So, uh, but he's a, he's an awesome dude. I'm sure you're excited about, uh, the week. There's a guy named Scotty Scheffler in the field. Who's uh, <laughs> pretty good. I mean, he is just, man, he's just whomping on y'all over the last uh, couple of weeks, but you know that you've been dealing with Scotty since you guys were 12, 13 years old, right? Yeah. Yeah. Too long. <laughs> yeah yeah he's nah, gonna he's, be tough out huh yeah i mean but i mean i'm super proud of him you know i mean get to get to see somebody that you grew up playing against become number one in the world and doing it in a very demanding uh style you know i mean it's every week week in week out it's it's unbelievable it's really really awesome to watch Chandler, I appreciate your time, my man. It was great getting to know you a little bit. Uh, go well this week in Houston. We'll be watching and continued success throughout the rest of your rookie season. Take it easy. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.